Thank you, Ken. Dear Madeline, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd just like to say how honored I am to be honored by you on your 30th anniversary, though it is somewhat depressing to know that I'm almost exactly the twice, <laughs> twice the age of this organization. On the other hand, I feel like I've known it my entire life. I will talk a little bit about the dark or darker side, but in the beginning, let me just say, first of all, every time I speak before an American audience, I always like to begin, uh, or at least have for, the, for three years, congratulated the United States for its position in the Internet Freedom Index put out by F Freedom House. There's another plug for Mr. Kramer. Um, uh, congratulate the United States for being second. Uh, <laughs> This year, however, I'm sad to say the United States has fallen to number three, but we've fallen to number two in Estonia because Iceland squeaked by us. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, it is always good to be among countries or in a country where internet freedom is, is ranked at the top and where people understand these issues. In my own country, uh, which I'll talk about a little, uh, we really have based our our progress from, uh, from what was a backward former Soviet Republic that really had uh, very, little, uh, very little to do with the 21st century or even the 20th century when we became independent to one of the most wired countries in the world, as Ken just said. Uh, that was a conscious decision. Initially, it was, it was really uh, a decision of desperation to move ahead, to make a leap, to get out of where we were. And it was just to make l things more efficient, more transparent, and more open. But as we, as we proceeded and as we brought more and more services and more and more aspects of life online, we began to see how much we could use the, the e-services to actually promote democracy, to promote transparency and openness in government, to allow citizens to participate, uh, and also to see um, to foster and create absolutely new and fundamental innovations in civ civil society. So that uh, ranging from things which can refer to the uh, we, you can, we have in Estonia actually a mechanism by which citizens propose legislation um, to the parliament, uh, which is um, doing it online and going through what uh, a process developed by, uh, uh, by James Fishkin at Stanford on a deliberative democracy, which we've done online and then uh, moved in the direction of getting parliament to actually have direct inputs. On the civic society side, perhaps some of you have heard of an organization that um, actually now works in about 100 countries. It's called Let's Do It World. It's a cleanup campaign that was invented by, in Estonia by, by uh, two guys from Skype, who are also, Skype is also from Estonia, uh, and the, uh, by which uh, we cleaned up a lot of garbage in our country, and everyone did it voluntarily after the Skype guys invented an app which they put on smartphones by which you could, where you could find by GPS, locate garbage, and then people would know where to go, and then we got another IT company to do, figure out the logistics. So we see that using technology, you can actually do all kinds of things that before were very difficult because cleanup campaigns are as, uh, at least 50 years old, but they never really worked, and now they've caught on in about 100 countries using this technology. A couple of things that we have done, which I'll just say briefly, with, <laughs> that uh, you do need to do if you want to move ahead in this world, is that uh, the fundamental issue of anything relating to IT is identity. You will recall the, uh, perhaps, the New Yorker cartoon of two dogs, one in front of a computer and <laughs> saying to the other, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. <laughs> that, th the problem is that it's, it's a joke, but it's not funny. The problem is that is the fundamental problem of what the internet is about, and that is what, uh, you don't know who it is that's contacting you, or is looking at your numbers, or your figures, or, or anything. So identity is key, 
And, uh, and, uh, and I think this is one of the problems that, uh, that the United States will have to face is uh, coming to terms with actually having a, a, a rigorous uh, and secure identity, which people are against here for various reasons, similar to opposition to gun control laws, I think. One of the other things that we did that is crucial and fundamental is that the citizen is the owner of his or her own data and has a right to see whoever is accessing those data. Uh, that is what allows trust in a government that actually uses uh, IT to the degree that we have. Uh, and we also, uh, we also have a law which says you, the government may only ask you for any bit of data once. Can, once you've given the government your address, for example, you never have to fill out your address again. Once, once you, <laughs> it actually makes life much more difficult for the government. But it, what it does do is it uh, it eases uh, it eases the uh, or reduces the friction of bureaucracy, and it also allows uh, I mean uh, allows people to feel more comfortable using all of the IT services that we offer. I said all that just just to prove that I'm not a luddite, because. The rest of my time, I'd like to talk about some of the things that we worry about. Uh, just a, so a few remarks on democracy, freedom, and our information age. Those of you who are old enough to remember, recall that in the 90s, Marshall McLuhan wrote about how we all lived in a global village. Uh, that was in the television age when um, we could see events such as the Vietnam War in, on our TV sets, and they were brought home. But it was an incomplete metaphor, because it wasn't a village then. We could see what was happening elsewhere, uh, based on what the editors of the television program or the censors in authoritarian societies decided we could see. Uh, but unlike in a real village, no one really was following you. And no one knew anything about you. But the emergence of the internet has changed this. Today, we truly live in a village. Anyone, anywhere can know as much, if not more, about you as, uh, as a, a hundred years ago, only a hundred people in your village knew about you. Uh, my grandfather was a, uh, was a child in a small peasant, in a small farming village in Estonia. Uh, only the neighbors knew anything about him. Today, where he living today, everyone would know everything about him if they wanted to. This is a trivial empirical truth, but consider also that in the past 150 years, hundreds of millions have fled from the village, from the shtetl, to cities, to other countries, to the new world, some to escape poverty, others uh, others to escape political oppression, or if you think back of the Bildungsromans of the first half of the past century, to es escape the small town world where everyone, in fact, did know everything about you. Well, there is no such thing anymore as a clean start. You will always be open to being investigated. Just a few keystrokes and everyone will know everything they might want to know about you. And I'm not talking about a government agency. Today we are, thanks to modern technology, back, truly back in the village. Thanks to governments, Google, apps you've downloaded in your smartphone, your credit cards, swipes, you are an open book and more of an open book than anyone has ever been. And this, this will have and already has had a profound, has had profound implications for what we consider liberal democracy and privacy two fundamental elements uh, that were given to us during the Enlightenment. Ladies and gentlemen, most of what constitutes the basis of modern liberal democracy actually has a short history of only four centuries. Thomas Hobbes posed the problem of the anarchy of life in a state of nature and the war of all against all. John Locke provided the theoretical solution of a contract between the government and the people. It has been tested, retested, refined in practice and in theory. The Peter Zenger trial 250 years ago, Voltaire, the Federalist Papers, Thomas Paine, John Stuart Mill, with refinements by Isaiah Berlin in two concepts of liberty and by others. 
For this night's purpose, it is important to stress that while the world has gone through immense challenges and changes, the industrializations, the space age, the advance of mass communication, radio and television, we successfully until now have squared the circle of liberal democracy and progress, especially technological progress. We will do so again, but these are more difficult times and challenges. When the thinker and Grateful Dead lyricist John Perry Barlow addressed governments in 1996 in his declaration of the independence of the internet saying, and I quote, your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us, unquote. He was right, he also left out privacy, but more right than we unfortunately bargained for, because in this age of the internet, we are back in a Hobbesian state of nature. All too often, we are in a war of all against all. Surveillance of the kind described as strictly fictional, the two-way television of 1948's 1948, 1984 by Orwell, is now in every computer, unless you tape your PC's camera, mobile phones or microphones, they also inform others where you are at any time. Big data knows and can deduce more about you than Big Brother ever did. And all this even without the state. Individuals and companies can do all of this. It's just that the state can do it better. As Rebecca McKinnon and Yevgeny Moroz have chillingly demonstrated, authoritarian states can and do use IT every bit as well as democracies without the restrictions imposed on their use in liberal democracies and do so to deprive their citizens of rights more effectively than they have in the past. And today, we are all in the midst of a massive debate on what liberal democracies can, should, and should not do with the extremely powerful technologies that we all now possess. Concepts such as privacy, confidentiality, and freedom of speech, especially anonymous speech, must be addressed in a new way because all of them have been redefined and indeed through technology have redefined themselves where precisely the legal concepts, to use Barlow's use of the term, that underpin liberal democracy truly no longer <clears throat> necessarily apply to us, whoever that may be, or to, to they need not apply to you, or they need not apply to the mafia, or to, the, to, a, <clears throat> to an authoritarian regime, or to the government, or kids under the age, legal age of responsibility. Do fundamental concepts such as what constitutes reasonable search and seizure, seizure apply to bits? Is a DDoS attack a legitimate form of social protest? What is identity, as I asked uh, in the beginning, when, we when even a dog can be on the internet? Who owns the data created each time you make a credit card swipe? or log your morning push-ups, or your driving route is passively recorded by your mobile telephone transmission towers on the way to work or anywhere else? What happens when you enter a bus and someone wears Google glasses that recognize who you are? And what about authoritarian societies where no democratic rights and freedoms apply? where the ability to restrict and modify and distort information is being taken to new and unprecedented levels where virtually <clears throat> virtual reality has an altogether different meaning. These are all questions I won't and in most cases cannot answer. A and I could go on posing them. But I mention even these just to point out that many of the self-evident truths underlying liberal democracy must be reinterpreted in the internet age. They must be readdressed. Today, 1984 and Brave New World, the classic dystopian novels I read in high school that were so formative in our thinking about liberal democracies, strike, I think, everyone as technologically naive in their assumptions. Or, I remember as a 10-year-old reading The Three Musketeers where the three of them are sitting around looking, burning a piece of paper and they said, well, let's, just, let's also throw the ashes out in case Richelieu has figured out how to read, read ashes. Um, well, today we cannot reconstitute ashes 
just as uh, Richelieu could not. But we can reconstitute the message. And uh, that's pretty scary. We are only beginning to figure out what freedom is online. We even have a coalition of countries defending it, though it's not at all clear everyone, everyone knows what it is. Uh, and I will, the day after tomorrow in London, begin chairing a group of private and public organizations and thinkers to figure out how we should proceed um, with ICANN, uh, and where we also feel, ever since the Snowden revelations, a renewed pressure by authoritarian regimes to participate more actively in internet governments. And we must be honest with ourselves, for in my part of the world, democratic Europe, many people feel their rights and privacy have been abused by a country they hitherto have looked to as the bulwark of defense of those very same democratic rights. So we live in a Hobbesian world. We need our Locke, and we need our Voltaire, and our Paine, our Mill, and our Isaiah Berlin for the digital age. And so that's why what my call is for all of you tonight to think about how we proceed to address these issues so that in fact we can maintain liberal democracy uh, in, to, <clears throat> with all of the challenges we have today. In Estonia, we have created our own kind of digital Lockean contract with the government as the guarantor of the rights and liberties of citizens based on consent and not fear. That has been our solution to the challenges in the digital world, a transparent system where the key to everything is a government that <clears throat> is, a, is a government granted secure identity, but as I said, the, all the data, uh, your data belong to you. Uh, that's one direction, I think, but I think there are many other things that need to be done. If you can enforce the rule of law in the digital world, there is no, <clears throat> there is no end of possibilities. Uh, we can do amazing things, and uh, we're only beginning to think of the good things we can do online if we, if we sort out the problems that have to do with privacy, data integrity, with rule of law. Um, and then I think we have a very bright future, but I think what we need to address right now is also the other side. How, how do we come to terms with the immense power granted to governments, but all kinds of other people today with the digital revolution. And so that I hope we think about these things and I hope that NDI comes up with some solutions and <laughs> we'll be working on it in Estonia, trying to develop some things and we hope we can work together with NDI on these issues. But I, I'll say again, it's, it, the issues are more complex than people have figured out. We're only, most of the world's only been uh, exposed to these issues since June but they've been around for a while and they will be around for a long time. So thank you very much. <laughs>